Thank you, Shafak. That was uh, extremely interesting, and no doubt there are topics that we're going to come back to before the, the day is over. Um, certainly, the NSS is struggling with this, this idea of is the, the challenge of Islam uh, towards uh, secularism. Um, and we are going to talk about it again later. But uh, now I'm going to introduce our third speaker, who is Keith Porteous Wood, the executive director of the National Secular Society. Keith is also celebrating uh, an anniversary this year. He's worked for the NSS for 20 years. And, <laughs> and during that time, he has achieved amazing things with the society. Uh, he's brought it into the modern age, and he's also uh, worked on so many campaigns, made so many contacts in the media, in Parliament, and all over the place that have benefited the society so much. Um, I'm a great admirer of his tenacity. He works from morning till night, and I can tell you that that's true, because I live in the same house that he does. And he's, he just never stops. The NSS is the centre of his life, and he has made a great success of it. So I'm, I'm pleased to welcome him now as our next speaker on this topic. I think we ought to have somebody to speak in opposition. I think that would be uh, an, an appropriate thing. Uh, but um, also, I want to say that that doesn't happen all on our own. And there's a guy right at the back there in the centre called Stephen Evans, who's right walking past the Bradlaw bust at the moment, uh, and the staff in the office, without which... Stephen, could you put your hand up, please? No. Without which we couldn't make the successes that we are. So I'm very grateful to the huge support from the office. Now, the most cursory examination of our secular charter, which we now have in your booklets a rather colourful uh, page of, on card, uh, will show you the close uh, affinity between secularism and human rights. The first article, my favourite, there shall be no established religion. Now, Heiner Bielfeld, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Religion and Belief, and for this purpose, belief means non-belief, and he was a very, he is a very religious man, said in 2012, it seems difficult, if not impossible, to conceive of an official state religion that in practice does not have adverse effects on religious minorities, thus discriminating against their members. Clearly, that applies in the UK, where the Church of England retains extraordinary privileges, the most notable of which, as you will all know, are the 26 bishops in the House of Lords and the UK being the only parliament, UK is being the only parliament to have religious uh, devotees or religious ex officio people uh, in the Western world in their parliament. And it's not ex exactly as if they're very representative of the country. They're actually not terribly representative even of the Anglicans because all of them voted against same-sex marriage and not realising that it was going to be leaked by one of his rather uh, uh, unloyal friends, the Archbishop of Canterbury rather unwisely recently boasted that the bench of bishops was the most conservative since the World War II. So, I mean, he was rather embarrassed about that, I think, but um, it, uh, the, uh, that is an indication of the conservatism of the wider Anglican communion of which, uh, Britain, uh, which Britain purports to lead, but doesn't really. All the leading is done in Africa, really, I think. Um, but nobody wants to give up, none of the archbishops of Canterbury want to give up this 
fallacy of us leading the Anglican community on their watch. And what they're doing in the process of that is destroying the church because uh, it's becoming less and less representative uh, of, of the country. And uh, even the majority of Anglicans think that there ought to be same-sex marriage. And we're not talking necessarily about same-sex religious marriage, though they might agree with that too. They're actually talking about same-sex marriages for the rest of us, the other 99% of the population, which they should not really be able to block, but are doing their damnedest, have done their damnedest to do so. And so that's a privilege, uh, a symbol of the privilege that they have in Parliament. Did you know that the Church of England is the only uh, institution that can actually institute laws that isn't within Parliament itself? It's, it's still shocking, that, um, I, I find. And, of course, it's because of establishment that uh, uh, we're paying for all the schools uh, which they are using to promote their mission with increasing fervency as their, uh, uh, their attendance goes down the pan, um, and where the non-religious have less schools at their disp places at their disposal uh, than practicing Anglicans. Now, that's a human rights issue if ever there was one. I suppose we should be grateful that it's not as bad as it was in the past, where we had uh, uh, Anglicans denied public office and Parliament and top universities, as was said earlier, um, uh, simply because they weren't practicing Anglicans. There's a plausible argument, actually, that the Church of England is not very far off imploding. And, and it is not uh, something that they actually disagree with. They acknowledge that on certainly homosexuality, they are going to split. And they're pretty small anyway. Um, and um, it's just how bad the split's going to be. Well, I'm not sure how you can split and it can be good. But anyway, um, so uh, it's that split, the absolute decline at a breathtaking level of... Uh, of church attendance, which has been going on actually for the last 100 years um, and is projected to go on for another 30, even the church's admission. I'm not quite sure what happens at that point. Perhaps there isn't anybody left. Um, and uh, the big point is that so many of the people in the pews are 70 or over um, and they can't go on forever. Uh, and once they've gone... Uh, there aren't any young, younger people in any number to, to, to support them, to, to follow them. And so that's the second major issue. The third one is actually child abuse, and that might surprise you, but you know that there are two major inquiries on at the moment, one rather I think, but, but, uh, from the Archbishop himself of, of one particular case to do with Bishop Peter Ball, uh, which he's rather unwisely decided to have an internal review on. Uh, and the, uh, from certainly what I know, that what's going to come out of that is absolutely jaw-dropping. Uh, I mean, I think that there has been a conspiracy uh, to pervert the course of justice over that case on an absolutely breathtaking case. And I'm not the only one to hold that view. And we've had some legal advice which confirms that. And, and when that all comes out, as it will do eventually... It will be astounding. We may have a little to do with that, but I can't say any more at the moment. <clears throat> um, so moving away from the Church of England, we actually have to worry about what follows. The, the sort of kind of nurse's idea of be, uh, be careful of what you, uh, what, what you criticise, what might follow might be worse. And that is a real worry for me. Uh, and it should be a real worry for all of us, that will the implosion of the Church of England cause the disestablishment for which we've all been fighting for for so long and then, dis then be replaced by some kind of multi-faith disestablishment. And that's what I think we've got to be on a, our real uh, alert to, to make sure that we prevent. But it's going to be very difficult. Um, I think we've already got the... Uh, the, the nascent uh, suggestion of that with uh, that uh, table at, uh, the, or, or the uh, platform at uh, Westminster 
uh, Abbey, and with the next coronation is going to be ever so crowded. Um, so uh, I think uh, we need to be very careful about that. But then moving abroad, we have so many mono-religious states, sort of going back to uh, Heiner Bielfeld's, uh, as it were, state religions, um, and many of them in the Muslim uh, and to a lesser extent the Buddhist world, um, where those who are not of the dominant faith are at best disadvantaged and at worst in mortal danger. And, and in all too many of them, uh, there's little freedom of conscience, bel uh, of belief, um, and this contravenes another article of our secular charter. There is freedom of belief, non-belief, and to renounce or change religion. And I expect in the very same places there's little freedom of expression or sometimes of movement, far less equality on grounds of sex or sexual orientation. So you see the connection between the secular charter and human rights. And why by fighting for the secular charter we're also fighting for human rights. Um, and continuing with the articles which these mono-religious countries transgress, we have two more articles. The judicial process shall not be hindered or replaced by religious codes or processes, or everyone should be equal before the law, regardless of religion, belief, or non-belief. And before I go further, I'd just like actually to say that this secular charter has been uh, something that the NSS has been working on for a long time with its uh, refocusing on human rights. Um, and I would just like to say a personal thank you to Afonso Rize Sousa, who's almost dead in the centre there, who has been, whose idea, he's just put his hand up very uh, hesitatingly. Go on, stand up, Afonso, please. He's our chair, uh, and he was also the... Uh, very, I think, patient author of the, uh, of the Secular Charter, because I have to say, it went through about 10 versions before we got there, and I'm very proud, and so is Terry uh, and the whole council of where we did actually get. But it's been a wonderful um, template and, and guidance, and quite often at council meetings, uh, uh, when we're thinking about a new campaign, you know, somebody says, well, is it in accordance with the Secular Charter? And we always have to think about that almost like the Ten Commandments, but I think we made sure it wasn't ten, but anyway, there we are. Right, um, so moving uh, to, back to this country, we, we can't just also pretend that all of these problems are in all of these mono-religious countries abroad, because I'm now going to talk about Sharia law. And unfortunately, when I say Sharia law, I can't say inverted commas. Well, I, I think Barbara Lavin did that, and that's a good way of doing it, because uh, I will not write down the word Sharia law without putting the word law in inverted commas. Um, and at the moment, the government's very, uh, uh, on the surface, very determined and saying, well, it isn't part of English law. Um, but it's kind of slowly getting there, and it's really, really worrying. And um, I'm angry uh, about the lack of, strength, of, of vision and of concern for human rights that we find in our establishment, um, that small e establishment, um, for uh, re retaining exclusively democratically determined human rights compliant law. It took us a long time to get here and we seem to be so keen to throw it away in, in some kind of misguided uh, idea that we must give religious minorities what they think they want or what the leaders of them think they want and it's so misplaced and so dangerous. I have the mother and father of a row at a big meeting in the European Union uh, not so long ago, where they actually, top lawyers, were having a debate about Sharia law 
And they, this was the absolute creme de la creme of European lawyers with a lot of academics there. And they were almost all saying, isn't this wonderful? Bring it on. And there were two of us there in a, in, in a room of 100 saying, you're off your trolley. But, I mean, it, it was depressing that there, were, that, that there seems to be this, uh, oh, well, you know, that's the right thing to do. And, 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 and it's just so stupid and so short-sighted. And it's the minorities within the minorities that suffer, of course, uh, and how they suffer. Um, and and I'm, I'm particularly concerned about academia in this respect because we seem to have the majority of, of people in academia, and there are some wonderful exceptions, and some of them are here, but there is an, almost the majority of people in, in, in that part of academia are just saying, kind of, bring it on. And, um, and I wondered whether we should say that some of these uh, universities are potentate-funded and whether that's got anything to do with it. Personally, I think it has. And that's frightening, too, because the funding ain't going to get any less from that source. Um, so then we have the Archbishop of Canterbury as was saying, oh, the, the, the advance of Sharia is, and I quote, inevitable which everybody read was, well, that's fine, get on with it. And um, I think he wished he hadn't quite said it, because he certainly, uh, it's probably one of the most famous things that he said. This is Rowan Williams, because nobody can understand anything else he said. Um, <laughs> unless you're a lot more intelligent than I am. Certainly Terry you never can. Um, and, but then you have the former Lord Chief Justice, Phillips, saying that there's nothing particularly radical about having Sharia as a method of solving family law disputes. Ah, what's right? This is supposed to be the top guy in the country, you know, all very establishment and knows everything about everything. And it just seems to be a kind of childhood category error. I mean, I just, I don't know whether I, it's me who's just, just missed it all. But I mean, from, let me explain why I think that's outrageous beyond belief. Let's look at the dispute that we had with the law society over Sharia wills. So why did we object to it? And indeed, we, have, we, had, we formed a wonderful alliance uh, and we were successful. But my goodness, it was pushing, you'll agree we were pushing water uphill on that. It was really, really hard going. And I honestly didn't think that we would we would, uh, we would win and we were told to clear off at the very top of the law society for quite a long time. Um, but this, what about this as, a, as principles for, for wills that were being endorsed, almost encouraged by the law society? So first of all, if you're not a Muslim and a Muslim by their definition, then you're not even eligible to inherit anything. I, I can't say how shocking I find that, that something to which you should be entitled and could be a huge amount of money or property or whatever, you're automatically excluded because you're not a Muslim. And then if you're a woman, now that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Yeah, so it, you, you're going to get half of, of these men, what the men are going to get, um, and, you know, that's just the, the way it is. You know, and there are some arguments, oh, well, you have some, uh, the men have slightly greater obligations, but that's never actually written in as a, well, you can get twice as much provided you do this, 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 and this. It's just, it's just it's clear sexism. And then children who are born uh, of, out of unions that are either have a non-Muslim in them or not an approved Muslim marriage are regarded as illegitimate. And guess what? They don't get any money either. So this is the kind of thing that Phillips is saying, well, there's nothing very radical about that. But the worst thing of all for me is actually custody of kids. Custody of kids isn't done on the basis of the best interests of the child. It's done on the basis of an arbitrary age. So you could get a husband, I don't know what the age is, you can tell me maybe to seven, 
Yeah, I, I was going to say seven. I thought, God, that's so young. But yeah. So you've got a really dreadful husband that has been violent and done all sorts of terrible things. And, uh, and yet the child has to become his uh, custody regardless of that, just because the child turns seven. And just imagine the harm that that could do. So this is, again, what Phillips thinks is unradical. Well, I don't know. It's just it's really, really worrying that we have so little understanding in these areas like academe, Europe, top of the law, top of the church, all seem to think these things are fine. Perhaps it's just us that are mad, but I just find it absolutely terrifying. Um, and it was good that, at least on that, that we were able to pull this, uh, this problem at the Law Society. And it was obvious what was happening. There were a group of people who uh, they wanted to, uh, um, to help, particularly lawyers in, in areas that had Muslims in them, uh, or were Muslims themselves, and say, look, we can make loads of money with these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of services, and uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, partly, it was partly money-driven and partly people who are clearly building their, their careers on effectively uh, using Sharia rather than admittedly becoming more expensive and the reduction of, of, of uh, legal aid, uh, standard proper courts for dealing with these things. And it is a worry that the reduction in legal funding is actually uh, feeding into some of this. So, what are we doing about all of these things? In an ideal world, we will be teaming up with religious liberals and moderates to progress human rights and protect them from attack, especially from the more orthodox. And I do reckon that that's where so many of the attacks on human rights are coming from. And we're always open to that. As Disney, you would agree that we are, and we love working with, with lots of people like the British Muslims for a secular democracy and Catholics for choice in Washington, D.C. But many of those religious moderates are having a turgid time they are under so much pressure from the so-called more orthodox people that seem to be getting stronger and stronger. And we won't talk about Saudi funding, whatever we do. We mustn't talk about that. But my goodness, there's a lot of it. Um, and very few Muslims have got the courage, as several people here today have, including Rahil Raza over there, who you're going to have the pleasure of hearing later. Um, to speak out. I was shocked when I spoke to the European religious correspondent of Reuters in Paris not so long ago. And he was trying to get some kind of response to the attacks in Paris um, and uh, get a kind of moderate voice to, to say, not in our name. And he was more or less crying on my shoulder, saying, I can't do it. They're all saying, it's like putting a target on my back. I'm afraid I can't stand up as a prominent Muslim and say, not in my name. And that is shocking. And I'm, I'm not uh, suggesting that... Uh, I don't understand why, and I'm sure there is some danger from it. But I think until we have uh, the people who are the subject of this, this terrible, uh, uh, the, uh, of these attacks on, on human rights, being prepared to say, not in my name, I don't think that we're going to succeed very far in stopping it. So... Um, that uh, has led us to think about, well, where else can we go? We always try and work with the moderates um, wherever we can. But we've had to think of other ways of trying to do it. So um, what we have done is to use inter international fora 
that's not flora, interflora, uh, international fora, um, such as the UN. Um, and I can still remember going to a major conference. This is the first time I certainly did it. Uh, was a, this major conference uh, of the Council of Europe in the very Catholic San Marino uh, enclave. Um, and I got up on the, on the podium and said that organized religion was one of the greatest threats to human rights and waited to see what was going to happen. Well, it did elicit a complaint from the Catholic Church, and I suppose I really ought to uh, uh, resign at that, this moment. But when we got to the end, uh, I mean, in fact, it, it did two very interesting things. It stopped the religious blacks, backslapping the, the slapping that there had been in the meeting up till then, all the people in funny frocks getting up and saying how much they respected human rights and all that kind of thing. I mean, it, it, actually, it actually stopped that dead in its tracks. But when we got to the end of the session and I went for coffee, I, there was a queue of people coming to talk to me and saying, and really senior people, di diplomats particularly, one from the UN saying, my goodness, if only I could say that, you've hit it right on the head. It was, it was quite, well, it was very... Uh, encouraging, but also discouraging that they didn't feel they had the mandate to do that. And similarly, um, when I was on the advisory council of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, um, the NSS was the organization who took that, uh, within that uh, council, the, that issue, the religious issue, the most seri uh, seriously. And we did a 100-page report saying, here are the threats to human rights from religion. And the director came back to me and he said, this is inspired. I hadn't realised how bad it was. Well, he did before too much longer because it wasn't long after that that, they were, that there was entryism into the, into the uh, council and it was particularly... Uh, the uh, very, very extreme Catholics trying to take away um, women's rights. Um, and would you believe there were three or four nom nominations from Brigham Young University? And, and in, this is in Europe, but I mean, it tells you about the strength of what we're up against. And, and I've been on radio a few times talking about Issues such as the, the sort of homophobia, if you can call I mean, the murderous homophobia in Africa. And it's very clear when you're talking to people who are there that the source of that is, all right, partly the imperial law that we left behind to our shame, but also zillions of dollars coming in from evangelicals in, uh, in, um, from America. And they see, uh, as they like to call it, protecting religious liberty as being something that they need to do in Africa and indeed in Europe because they think it's coming to a cinema near them soon. And that's, that's part of their justification. So that's really all quite scary stuff. Um, so also, uh, when we were in the European Union, um, Stephen Evans and I were very active at presidential and vice presidential level, particularly on Sharia law and the adverse uh, implications for women. And we also uh, have been working with our international affiliates at the Council of Europe and the United Nations, um, for which, again, I, I, I thank Shafak. So we just need to watch about the undermining of human rights um, as a Western construct, which is happening more and more often. Um, and uh, that's something which I think we need to, to watch. Um, and 
I've been very grateful for the work, uh, for the help of the work at the UN, um, from Roy Brown, who's there right in the centre, he's about to put his hand up, who's the chef de mission there, helped us very much on the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and we've worked with the Christian Institute even, less moderate, but when we've worked together, w because we have such different people supporting us, when we actually lock together and get them all going, we can even beat both the Conservative and Labour front bench against us, something the political textbooks will say you can never do, but we've succeeded that. So, um, I just want to conclude by saying it, it's the same people often, from, often fronted from the US that are using these euphemisms for religious exemptions, religious freedom, religious conscience, uh, exceptions and accommodations that we need to fight. And the thing I'm probably most proud of of all was the NSS's role in spotting the, uh, the European court uh, challenge by evangelical Christians over gay issues and, and, and uh, health and safety issues, bringing religion to the top of a hierarchy of rights, the Le Daily case, McFarlane um, and Chaplin, and that we were able to go to the, U to the European court and intervene and get those cases turned over. And I think in doing so, we saved European equality law. Thank you.